please consider becoming a member of my channel. For $2.99, you will get priority replies and emojis. For $5.99, you'll get early access, membership holes, priority replies, and emojis. With both, you will get shoutouts. Patreon is now up. If you wish to support my content, go to my Patreon page, pick a tier that's right for you. Link will be in the description. Now, on to the video. The criminal justice system is meant to be fair to those accused of crimes. You are meant to get legal representation, to defend yourself against accusations, and to face your accuser, and to be judged by a jury of your peers. But what happens when two judges care more about money than justice? In Pennsylvania, that happened. Two judges took kickbacks to give harsher sentences to offenders for a for-profit institution. But this wasn't a for-profit prison. This was a juvenile detention center, and these two judges were sentencing children and teens, with some sentences being so unfair that those who were brought before the court were more innocent than guilty. Before I begin, this is going to get emotional. You might feel rage for the actions of all involved, and upset for those who had to suffer at the hands of these people. But that's okay. This topic has done the same for me. I had to walk away from researching this multiple times due to how I was feeling. With that said, let's get into it. In 1999, there was a tonal shift on how to deal with juvenile delinquents. While before, kids and teens were given chances of redemption, and most bad behavior was handled by schools and parents. That was until Columbine happened. After Columbine, there were places in the country that felt juveniles needed stricter punishments. So a lot of places began to develop zero tolerance policies for juvenile offenders. Luzerne County, Pennsylvania was one of those places. They elected a zero tolerance judge to serve the juvenile court, Judge Mark Cavarella. Cavarella was a popular judge. He would go to schools and warn kids that if they ended up in his courtroom, he would show them no mercy, telling them, if you come before me, I will send you away. And when kids came to his courtroom, he would ask them if they had been to one of his speeches at school. If the kid answered yes, then he would ask them what he said, because he didn't want to repeat himself. I'm pretty sure he hated kids. I will get into that more later, but he was really strict. He threw the book at any kid who came into his court, but there is one thing for sure. He was a hypocrite. While he was sentencing children, sometimes for minor things that a judge shouldn't rule on, he himself was breaking the law and the trust of the people that he served. Here's how it worked. Four men plotted to make as much money as they could out of the criminal justice system through kickbacks. Judges Michael Conahan and Mark Calvarella, lawyer Robert Powell, and developer Robert Miracle. The plot, to open for-profit juvenile detention centers. Robert Powell, the lawyer, was interested in developing detention centers. He got in contact with his friend Michael Conahan, who was also a superb businessman. To get this project off the ground, they went to developer Robert Miracle. Two years after the plot began, Conahan was given the title of president judge. It's what it sounds like. Conahan was friends with Cavarella and everything was in place. Instead of sending teens and kids to the county-run juvenile detention centers, Cavarella would send them to the for-profit ones. Conahan had the power to budget whichever he saw fit to, and he chose the for-profit juvenile detention centers, giving Powell $1.3 million in annual rent for the for-profit detention centers. He then cut off funding for the county-run detention centers. Then they refused to send the kids and teens to the county-run juvenile 
Juvenile Detention Centers in favor of four of the for-profit ones. Then the four men were able to get the state to fund the for-profit detention centers for $58 million. The judges were given kickbacks for every child and teen they put into these for-profit centers. Kickbacks, which would total $2.6 million. And with Cavarella being a juvenile court judge, he stood to profit. And he had a high conviction rate. Suspiciously high. But the residents of Luzerne County didn't think anything of it. But in total, 2,500 kids went in front of Cavarella. More than 6,000 cases. Some of these cases are so petty that it isn't funny. Fifty percent of the kids who went before Cavarella did not have legal representation. That's because some of the cases were so small that the police told the parents they didn't really need representation. Other times, Cavarella himself was able to trick parents into signing waivers. Because of this lack of legal representation, it made it easier to get the child into the system so they can be sent to the detention centers. Which, for reference, while it was budgeted for millions of dollars, there were times that the electric was cut off because they didn't pay the bills. All the money was going to these four men. Cavarella also wouldn't take appeals. To some, this showed how zero tolerance he was. To others, something was fishy. But let's talk about some of the cases that Cavarella resided over. Before I do, trigger warning. There are going to be stories on here that are hard to hear, including two that involves kids who took their own life. I had pretty good grades, but I was a cheerleader. I was in the orchestra until ninth grade. I did good in school. Joelle Angeli's brush with the law came at age 15 after she took her grandfather's credit card and ran up a bill of a couple of thousand dollars for clothes. What happened in court? I remember him saying this and staring right at me. Have you ever disrespected your grandfather? And you were honest? Yes, I said yes, and my grandfather was standing right next to me. He then said, you're remanded. And they walked me out, they put me in handcuffs and shackles in a side room sat me in a holding cell and walked my grandfather by me as he cried. There was a teenager who walked into a store and stole nutmeg. They sent him to a detention center for that. A mother of a 12-year-old boy named Eric Stefanski watched her son being dragged away in shackles. He read me my charges and said, how do you plead? I didn't know what to say, so I looked at my mom and I said, guilty. At 12 years old, Eric was locked up for two years. How many questions did they ask you or him about his record. Oh, none. None about his record. None about nothing to do with his life. None. And what did your attorney say? I didn't have one. I did not think it was necessary. On his first offense, he, he's so young, I just didn't think that was necessary. Eric had taken her car out for a joyride. He ended up running over a barrier, which smashed the undercarriage. In order for her insurance to pay for the damages, she needed to file a police report. Because Eric was a child with no criminal record, she thought that he would just get away with probation or a warning. She felt that there was no need for a lawyer in this matter. Unfortunately, that 12-year-old boy went in front of Mark Cavarella, who sent him to a detention center for two years. The mother was shocked and devastated that instead of her kid getting the talking to he needed, he ended up going to a place that can be described as a prison. Hillary Transu was 14 years old when she wanted to get back at her vice principal. The vice principal apparently had a stick up her ass, and Hillary thought it would be a bit funny to make a mock MySpace page. Which, yeah, that would be funny. And it was clearly marked as a joke. She posted a disclaimer on the page that it was not a real person, that it was a joke, writing, When you find this, I hope you have a sense of humor. So let me ask you, is there anything in there that is illegal? No? Well, the vice principal was so much of a Karen that when she found it, she contacted the authorities and claimed harassment. Nothing about this is harassment, and I hope this vice principal ended up getting fired. The police came to Hillary's home, talked to her parents. When Hillary's parents wanted to call a lawyer, the police just told her there was no need for a lawyer, because most likely all Hillary would get is probation, on a charge that, might I remind you, is bogus to begin with. So her parents signed a waiver, which turned out to be a big mistake. Parents, if your kid is in trouble with the law, get a lawyer and stand your ground. They deserve the best representation, even if they did something heinous. That is how the legal system is supposed to work. 
Hillary's hearing lasted only a minute, which for reference is a conduct violation. Judges are supposed to look over all the evidence before making a decision if there is no jury, and you cannot do that in a minute. According to Lauren, Hillary's mother, Cavarella slammed his hands down and said, what makes you think you can get away with this crap? Which is also a conduct violation, by the way, because actual court is not like those trashy court shows you see on television. Judges are supposed to act with a level of decorum. Judges are supposed to remain unbiased and keep their emotions in check. Outbursts like this have cost judges their jobs. Lauren was able to get Hillary out of the detention center in three weeks, though. She did so by calling the Juvenile Law Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hillary was given probation for the MySpace page. Let that sink in. Hillary became troubled after, and it seemed like she was spiraling out of control. But she was able to turn her life around. If it was 2007, uh, when I was on the phone with a friend, um, and we were just chatting, and I heard a call from the bottom of the stairs. My mother uh, sounded irate, and she yelled up to me, do you know anything about a MySpace page? And I said, yeah, from like months ago. Um, How old were you? I was 15. What, um, what was this MySpace page? It was a parody page about my vice principal. Um, <clears throat> a couple of friends and I decided it would be funny to make fun of the school disciplinarian on the internet. Um, and so we created this page and, and I remember putting a disclaimer on it thinking, if anybody finds this, um, at least I can't get in trouble for it. And you said things like, um uh, you talked about her and said she spends most of her time reading silly teen magazines, daydreaming about Johnny Depp and nothing but tidy whiteies. Ooh la la. Yes. A 12-year-old boy got into an argument with his stepfather. The boy was not a big child. He was small for his age. In a fit of anger, he threw a piece of meat, a steak, at his stepfather. He was charged with assault and sent by Cavarella to a detention center for two years. Melanie Petrillo was also 12 years old when she was sent before Judge Cavarella. She had invited a friend over and that friend set fire to a waste bin. So she was completely innocent of any crime. But Cavarella would not let her speak in her own defense. Like many, her parents waived the right to a lawyer. She was sent to one of the detention centers where she described it as horrifying, that she needed to put a blanket over her head to stop the cockroaches from falling on her. Again, the reason is very simple. The four were profiting off of the detention centers, filling them without paying to keep them maintained. It was all about money, not about reforming the lives of children. Cavarello would claim that he never forced people to waive the right to a lawyer. And in one instance, he claimed he would not allow that to happen again, which is bullcrap. He was still trying to force the waiver so he could send these kids to prison. And his actions screwed up Melanie's life. She began hanging around with the wrong crowd and would be in front of Cavarella on multiple times in her teens. He ruined her life and it's still something that Melanie is trying to get past. Yeah, a little sad face. And, uh, there's one. Jamie Trocky was 16 when Judge Chivarella sent him away, still a boy who signed letters home with a frowning face. His offense? Underage drinking and driving, and behind in paying the fines. Zachary Richards was just 14 when he stole a Hershey bar. He would spend his teenage years in and out of the for-profit detention centers, which, stealing a chocolate bar does not equate to spending time in a detention center. And at age 27, he took his own life. I was in eighth grade, I was 13. Me and this girl, we used to be friends. But she was sitting there calling me a slut and a whore and I can't stand you because we weren't friends anymore. So I threw a volleyball at her. Then when she walked past me, she did one of those hair kind of flips in my face. And then I had it, it, my, it was over. We ended up fighting. They took me to the office with the police officer, called my father, told him to come get his crazy daughter out of their school. She's starting trouble. Your kid was locked up for slapping a girl. The student never went any farther than the local magistrate if the school wasn't satisfied with suspending her for three days. Not out to a juvenile judge. And then to find out it was all from greed. This lady, she pulled my dad back and she grabbed my arm and she's like, come with me. 
There's one last story I'm gonna tell. This one is really hard to get through. Edward R. Kensikowski III was 17 years old. He was an all-star wrestler. Never had a conviction. He was on the fast track in life, college bound. The only thing he did do was drink. He started drinking at age 14. His future was bright and his father was worried. So he hatched a plan with a police officer friend. Ed's father planted a marijuana pipe in Ed's truck. The plan was that the officers would find it and scare the boy straight, but that didn't happen. Instead, he went in front of Cavarella and was sent to a detention center and a wilderness camp. Here's a clip of Ed's mother talking about what led up to Ed going in front of Judge Cavarella. Juvenile court isn't until Tuesday, so for the weekend, he had to stay in, in jail. Um, Tuesday comes along, and now all along, you know, we're talking to the probation people. We're talking actually to the judge also. There was a sit down in, you know, with these judge cops and knowing Judge Chivarella that this was all, you know, in his best interest just to get him a little slap on the wrist, wise him up, scare him straight. He's a great kid. He has a great future ahead of him. Um, and yep, we know there's, you know, nothing you have to worry about. We don't need a lawyer. The same, same story. You got off the elevator and they were there. Do you have a lawyer? No, we were told. We don't need one okay sign and that was it um i don't know i was just very naive and i mean i was never in my wildest dreams would i think these people that are supposed to have they you know they were the professionals they have your child's interests at best 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 at heart and um these are the people that you trust and everything's going to be okay you know he's going to learn a little lesson and everything will be fine. And we stood there and in 30 seconds he was cuffed and shackled and taken away. And I mean, that was the worst feeling. I'd, seeing him turn and look at me like, you know, what's going on? And there was nothing I could do. Um, that's frozen into my psyche for the rest of my life. That look that was on his face. He missed his senior year. In an instant, his life went from promising to losing everything. A pipe found in his truck is a minor offense, a probationary offense. He had no criminal history to warrant going to the juvenile detention center. He was there for five months. He was bitter and depressed. He had lost chances at a scholarship with a big college. His girlfriend left him. He couldn't go back to school for his senior year. He went from a free-spirited teen to a hardened man who didn't trust the police or the system. He tried to turn his life around. He even got a job, but a fight with another person caused him to go in front of Cavarella once more, and he was sent to another juvenile detention center. After the four months, at age 20, he again got into a fight with another person. This time he was an adult, and he was sent to prison. He got out five months before he decided to end his own life. On June 1st, 2010, he left home. He walked into the woods with a gun, and he shot himself in the heart. He was only 23. One of the 2,500 lives that Cavarella, Conahan, Powell, and Miracle had ruined. There are more stories, but these are the ones that seemed the most anger-inducing and heart-wrenching. In a time between 2004 and 2008, the Pennsylvania Judicial Board had received four complaints about Conahan, but these were not investigated. The FBI began investigating claims of nepotism in the county court system in 2006. In 2007, the Juvenile Law Center had begun its own investigation into claims of improper sentencing. Finding something, in 2008 they petitioned the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to seek relief for kids and teens whose civil rights were violated. This measure didn't pass, but in 2009, corruption charges were levied against Mark Cavarella and Michael Conahan. In fact, Judge Arthur Grimm, a Pennsylvania juvenile judge himself, now assigned to review Judge Chivarella's cases, has seen just the opposite. The kids were in there for relatively minor first-time offenses and ended up being placed. The judge is, is incorrect. I'm seeing cases which seem to take in the neighborhood of a minute and a half to three minutes. That simply is not the way to do business. It doesn't happen in three minutes. The IRS also investigated because those kickbacks, well, to hide their tracks, they were not filed under taxes, so tax evasion. In 2009, both judges ended up being charged with wire fraud and tax evasion. But before that, what happened to Powell and Miracle? Well, Miracle would receive one year in prison for withholding information in a felony. Robert Powell was sentenced to 18 months in prison for his role. When this hit the mainstream media, to say there was outrage was an understatement. It shocked many people. You, you're going to throw away 4,000 kids' lives. God knows how many of those kids shouldn't have been in prison because you wanted more money. 
We're way too soft on these people. Oh, he was a judge. That makes it a million times worse. Not any better, but you know they get ten times more respect than the average guy who goes in there and who stole nutmeg for four bucks. The people of Luzerne County felt betrayed, and it was a stain on the criminal justice system. The outrage spread. Both judges initially pled guilty and were sentenced to seven years in prison. And it was because of Mark Cavarella that the plea was thrown out, because he couldn't shut the hell up. Mark Cavarella is pretty much the worst human being ever to be a judge. We can all agree on that. But he also had a habit of loving to hear himself talk. And in the moment he should have exercised his right to remain silent, well, he didn't. Call you back. You know, a lot of people are wondering how a man of such distinction like yourself could have gotten in so much trouble and sold these kids down the river. Well, let's stop right there. Didn't sell any kids down the river. And what they describe as to what happened in your courtroom is, is pretty amazing. You take a look at their file and you look to see if this was the first time they had a run-in with the law. Might have been the first time you were in front of me. You may be surprised that it's not going to be as clear-cut as they would like you to think. I'm seeing cases which seem to take in the neighborhood of a minute and a half to three minutes. That simply is not the way to do business. It doesn't happen in three minutes. For weeks after the plea agreement, all he did was run his mouth. He was going around town talking about it, talking to the press, telling people that he was innocent. According to Calvarella, all he did was not disclose that he had been given finder's fees, stating that he wasn't sending kids there for kickbacks. As in, he was trying to cover his own ass. So guess what happened? He effed around and found out. But before I get into that, Conahan was just as bad. He just straight up refused to talk. He refused to help with investigations. And well, the judge in charge of the case threw out the plea agreement and the trial was underway. The judge looked at the public statements made by Cavarella and realized Cavarella cared more about himself than what he did, claiming to be innocent while pleading guilty. At this point, the investigation uncovered everything to prove that the money he was given was not a finder's fee. It was pretty much a bribe to fill a for-profit detention center. Before I continue, I want to show this clip. This is Sandy Fonzo. She is the mother of Edward Kenzikowski. She laid into Cavarella on the steps of the court. This is not a cash for kids case, and we hope somebody oh, starts it? getting because the my message. My kid's not here anymore. Ma my kid's not here. He's dead because of him. He ruined my fucking life. I'd like him to go to hell and rot there forever. No, you know what he told everybody in court? They need to be held accountable for their actions. You need to be. Do you remember me? Do you remember me? Do you remember my son, an all-star wrestler? He's gone. He's gone to some of the heart. You scumbag! You ruined my fucking life! She had seen he was in a press conference, not shackled, just standing next to his lawyer. Her anger is justified, and I salute her for what she said to Cavarella. She lost her son. Her son's life was ruined. Remember, he did not have a fair trial. The pipe bound in his truck was planted there, and it was a misdemeanor offense, not worth sending him anywhere. And Cavarella unjustly imprisoned him and ruined his life. And he died because of the depression this caused him. But back to the judicial proceedings. The two judges probably thought they could still skate this through. That was until their charges got a major upgrade. They were both looking at racketeering, money laundering, fraud, extortion, and tax evasion. Conahan ended up pleading guilty to the new charges in 2011, receiving 17.5 years in prison. Nine years later, a certain virus happened to be spreading across the planet, and he was let out because of concern for his health. Now on to the asshole, also known as Mark Cavarella. For a judge, he should know when his back is against the wall and he had no chance. But he decided he wanted to go to trial, and in 2011, after 11 days, he was found guilty of 12 of the 39 charges against him, given a sentence of 28 years in prison, and he had to pay $900,000. In 2018, some of his convictions were overturned, but the sentence of 28 years was upheld. And unlike Conahan, the virus didn't get him out of prison. Oh, he tried. He went to federal court to try to get out early on compassionate release. Maybe if he had changed his attitude, accepted that he was a complete monster for his actions, then the judge would have thought about it. But because... To this day, he downplays everything, he's still locked up in prison, where he'll likely spend the rest of his life, as he is 72 years old as of the time of this video.
This scandal proves why prisons and detention centers should not be for profit. They should be run by the state or the county governments. Before you try to tell me that there's more of a burden on taxpayers for it to be state run, there's evidence from this case and many others that for profit prisons can cost taxpayers more because they are privately owned and the state has to pay them. People who own these prisons can charge whatever they want, while a state prison is more fixed. 2,000 cases that Cavarella presided over were overturned. But while those kids had their records cleaned, it wasn't enough. Most of these kids suffered heavy mental issues, and some live with mental scarring to this day. In 2011, Robert Miracle was sued by some of the families, and rightly so. He settled the case for $17 million. In 2015, Robert Powell was sued. He was ordered to pay $4.75 million. According to Powell, while testifying in this, he was forced to pay the judges in order to keep their support. Take that as you will. The civil suits against the judges started in 2009. This took a long time because the judge that was presiding over it had to hear 300 different testimonies. These testimonies brought back a lot of mental trauma for the kids who had lived through them. 65 of the kids had dropped out of school. A majority of them suffered depression and anxiety, and some suffered some kind of addiction, all because of greed of four men. In October of 2021, the case finally ended, and in August of 2022, Conahan and Cavarello were forced to pay $200 million. But it is unlikely that the families and the kids will see any of that money. The former judge's assets are going to be probed, but it is uncertain if it will equal up to that. It is still a victory in the minds of all involved. It sets a precedent that the judicial system is no place for capital gain. This was seriously hard to get through. The stories of what these kids went through was just anger-inducing. I believe that there is good within the justice system. That when it works for the betterment of society, it sends people to prison who deserve to be there. But when it's corrupted, when those who are willing to use it for greedy purposes, it can ruin lives. Privately owned detention centers are a bad idea. It is reasonable to use this case as an argument that it is. I get taxpayers want to keep the hard-earned money they receive and hate taxes, but would you rather run the risk that a judge is in the pocket of a for-profit prison or detention center, or pay to make sure a state prison keeps the prisoners behind bars? 6,000 cases. 2,500 lives were ruined because of two judges, a lawyer and a real estate developer. Those men decided that they could corrupt the system. One was elected off of the fear of another Columbine. Kids and teens aren't perfect. They do dumb shit. But to throw a girl in a juvenile detention center over a MySpace page, a 12-year-old for throwing a steak, a 14-year-old for stealing a chocolate bar, all of those are far too excessive. Cavarella, Conahan, Powell, and Miracle didn't care about the lives they ruined. They didn't care about the innocence they threw behind the walls of a facility they failed to maintain properly. All they cared about was putting money in their pockets.